All right. Well, I'm Richard with Google. I am here with Lori today to talk a little bit about cloud and development and things like that. Lori, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Lori Barth. I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix. Awesome. I really appreciate you joining us here today. Just wanted to kind of learn a bit from you about how developers may be thinking about distributed systems, things that may even start stretching into other clouds, to kind of make sure we're, we're factoring in all the different perspectives. So really, first off, at what point do you think in a developer's workflow, do they start to care where their software actually runs? Do you care up front? Do you care when you're about to deploy? What point does a developer care? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think um, it sort of depends on what role you're playing on a team, right? So if you're the developer whose job it is to architect the system, to think about the different integration points, um, then you really care up front. You need to model that into your design to a certain extent. You can always adjust later, but it's helpful to know those things if you have the answers um, at the top of your project. That being said, if you are a team member who's focused on a specific um, part of the project, a specific smaller subsystem, you don't necessarily have to worry about it until a little bit later in the process. That might be end-to-end -end testing. Um, you might not need to worry about it until you deploy. You might not even need to worry about it until you're asked to uh, solve, you know, a real-life user issue where you need to replicate their environment and figure out, you know, what that actually looked like on their machine. Yeah, that's interesting. So, do you think that? I mean, where do things maybe like I don't know, load balancing and security config and which database you have available? Are there just some assumptions you can make up front and whether that's going in your data center, it's going in a public cloud, you're just going to use some certain abstractions and work OK in there? Or again, depends on the role if you're the architect versus the one coding business logic. Yeah, it depends on whether you're ar the architect. It also depends on, you know, where in the stack you're working and what scale you're working on. There are systems that never deal with load balancers. We don't talk about them very often because in these larger companies, that's not normally the case, but they do exist. Um, and then especially if you're on the front end side, a lot of that's abstracted away from you and you don't necessarily need to care about it in the same way. You just need to hit your API and assume that uh, your load balancer and everything else is dealing with parallelization and um, distribution the way that you need it to. Um, so so it's it really does depend what role you play on the team. And that's not just architect or developer. It's also where in the stack you're uh, having an impact and whether or not your system is working at scale. I mean, if you're building your own personal website, I don't know that you ever really know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so that's interesting. So do you think if you look at the dev experience, you know, for the most part, should that workflow feel the same, whether I'm hitting AWS or Google Cloud or whether I'm hitting a data center? Like, is any part of the dev workflow for my local development testing cycle, for the most part, can that stay pretty similar? It can stay pretty similar if you're using tools that give you a good local development experience that mimics what you're going to experience on the cloud. Now, granted, there are situations in which that's not really possible and you have to build and deploy every time you want to test something and that's less than ideal. Um, so as long as you have those good local setup tools, then yeah, you should be able to mimic what you're dealing with in the cloud pretty seamlessly. What about from the security perspective? So how do you think about the architecture dev experience when it comes to platform security? Again, if I'm going maybe to a more, I don't know, an isolated environment, I might have different security considerations. Or again, is that not bleeding back into my application development experience as much? Do you see that as security architect overlay, or how does the security stuff come into play, especially when I start thinking about where this thing may end up? Yeah, I think a lot of that depends on how robust the security of your organization is and whether sort of turnkey solutions already exist. In places where they do, oftentimes you are um, making an entire sort of front door for your application that all of your authentication proxies through that. You don't need to worry about anything. Um, in cases where you need to roll your own, yeah, that's definitely consideration ahead of time. And, um, you know, I think everyone will say that once you get to the point of dealing with permissions and roles, that's where you start questioning every assumption you've made about what you're going to build. Um, so, yeah, you, you definitely have to worry about considerations. But at the same time, like, the things you're running locally, you're probably running, you know, let's say an Elasticsearch instance locally, and you're hitting that, and it's not until you're actually working in the prod stack and deploying things that you have to worry about the security groups to consider, um, you know, who can actually hit that cluster. Yeah, I think that, that that's pretty interesting. I think it, I, I think I've noticed, maybe you see it too sometimes in, in the public cloud space, there can be this mentality of, I have to know everything about this environment as I get started, and I have to know all these details. and. I'm not sure that's true. Like, do you feel like, you know, even if you're all in on a public cloud, how much of that bleeds back into the process? 
Yeah, I think a lot of that depends on whether you're working on new or existing software or even a new or existing feature. If you're developing something for the first time, there's a lot of sort of mocking and, um, you know, dummying up of things that you can do to get through the development process. And then you work towards the integration and deployment layers. Um, if you're working on something that exists, then you have to be a little bit more finicky about exactly what you're mocking and how much it matches what's actually in production at the moment. Yeah, that's a great call. That's a good differentiator. So you wrote a good post earlier this year on uh, even just setting up your local machine. You know, what do you do when you boot up or when you just kind of bootstrap your, your local dev environment? So, you know, if you're working with developers, architects, others yourself, and you think about what does a developer need on a local machine when they are building something that goes to cloud? Like, what is that table stakes thing that if a developer is listening to this going, hey, I'm starting to do more cloud stuff. What's kind of must have on that machine? Docker. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you really got to have Docker if you're going to try and create some semblance of an environment that isn't your local dev machine, right? That's that's the best way to do it. If you're dealing with customers who might be on Windows and you're working on a Mac machine, something like VMware or similar is very helpful um, to get something up and running that you can actually look at and interact with. Um, and whatever we mentioned before that depending on the sort of maturity of your organization, you might have some security stuff. Um, whatever packages and tools you need to do to proxy your local dev experience for whatever whatever that tool is, is um, pretty important. Uh, so whether that's, you know, your a Google Authenticator or, or something else like that, that you have some, some larger ecosystem around security that you need to be mocking and pretending to be an authenticated user or whatever user you're debugging for. How do you think about sandboxes? Do you like everything just locally simulated and say, hey, this is just going to feel like this? Do you think each developer has their own sandbox carved out in some production like environment? How do you like to how do you like to mock production? Like, how do you do you want local simulations or do you want to actually put this into the real environment, even for the dev cycle? Um, I like local simulations because I think the feedback loop can be a lot faster depending on how many different local simulations you have to be running at once. I like the idea of a sandbox where you're really trying to dive into a real life scenario and say, okay, can I duplicate the scenario that was happening for this user for debugging? I think that's super helpful. But for feature development, I'd rather work on my local environment than in a sandbox, but that's not always possible. Um, so my personal preference isn't as important as what is theoretically actually going to work. <laughs> <laughs> so when I look at the multi-cloud argument, you know, some cases the argument put forth is, hey, it's best of breed. Like all these clouds aren't the same. There's there's awesome things in each public cloud. There's things I don't even think of in other clouds I don't I don't use all the time. So but do you buy that best of breed argument for that? Or do developers bring their software with them? Like, hey, we love, you know, Vault. We're going to use that as our secret score store on every cloud. Or, hey, you know, the databases offered by my primary cloud are fine. Yeah, this one maybe is a little better, but I'm not going to switch all clouds for this. So where do you think, do you think best of breed is a real argument? And if it is, are there certain types of services where maybe that matters? It's a real argument in one of two cases. So it's a real argument if you are picking a cloud for the first time and you don't have a bunch of uh, expected tools. And in that case, then yes, go with the thing that works best with the cloud you're working on. The other scenario in which it makes a difference is if you're working with this situation where it truly is incompatible. Um, and you have to make a change and therefore you go with the thing that's sort of best in breed. Beyond that, I think a lot of people bring their tools and it's not just that they're bringing the tools that they like, they're bringing the tools that are already implemented and they don't wanna go back and redo them. Right. So to you, is lock in a bad word? And if, you know, if not, or if so, I mean, when is it fine? Login is a complicated word. I think it gets a little bit overused. So lock in, applies for every project you'll ever work on in some capacity. You are locked into some piece of the technology that you've chosen. Otherwise, you're going to do a fundamental rewrite. If you write something in React, it's going to be a fundamental rewrite to write it in Vue. If you write something in Java, it's going to be a fundamental rewrite to write it in Node, right? So you're always locked into a certain extent. And I think we tend to think of sort of third party providers as the thing we don't want to be locked into. but you're locked into your libraries and your dependencies to a certain extent. You're always going to have to rewrite some things. So I think that there's a little bit of a plug and play assumption with cloud that isn't necessarily fair, given all of the software interfaces that a lot of these clouds are providing for you, whether that's for security or load balancers or databases. For goodness sakes, if you want a plug and play database that's stored in the cloud, you're going to have to rewrite half your system anyway. 
Um, you might have to only do it at the you know database and persistence layer, but you're going to have to rewrite something. You're going to have to rework your tables if it's in a different querying language, whatever it is. So I don't think lock-in is a bad thing. I think you have to recognize that you are going to be locked in to a certain extent, depending on what your project is. And if you're okay with the idea that you're going to have to rewrite things if you need to migrate to another cloud, then lock-in's fine. Um, it's the scenario in which you expect to be able to sort of like pick up and spin up somewhere else in a week that it's a bad thing. But in that case, you're gonna have to put in a lot of thought to how you architect your system because you'll be locked in pretty much regardless of what you do. Do you think there's layers there where some people say, hey, maybe I don't wanna be locked into an IaaS at this point because that's lower level infrastructure or storage provider versus, hey, I might be locked into my AI tool because that's super novel stuff. Or is it all the same sort of argument that you're making? You're really just making some choices of, of where portability is something you would actually engineer for versus just accept the fact that there's a cost. It's all relative. Um, so you are always going to be locked in to a certain extent, but there are certain types of tools where that lock-in is a comes with a lot more friction to get out of um, than other tools. So you know you're deeply integrated, for example, with your front-end framework, but you're maybe less deeply integrated with your um, you know PDF image bucket, for example. That's just sort of like a storage place. That, that you could probably change out a little bit. You're changing a URL and, and making your security groups set up. You should be good to go. Um, but it's, it's relativity. It's always going to require some change. It's very rare that you can just pick up something and drop it into something else without any considerations. At the very least, you have to reconfigure everything, right? So that's work. This was terrific. Laurie, I appreciate you, uh, you sharing some wisdom with the team and uh, appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.